facets of Crawley artist. You know, growing up on Cape Cod, my family was a, an old bootlegging family. My grandfather was a sea captain, and he settled on the Cape. And my grandfather and Joe Kennedy were rum runners together during Prohibition. I had a promising ski career going in uh, high school. Broke my neck in two places riding a horse. Got out of the hospital, couldn't do much. So I went to work for a silversmith and started making jewelry. It was nothing that I'd ever done. I even took art in high school, but it was some light work. And I really liked it. So I pursued the jewelry career, headed to New York City to learn fine jewelry, and was there for the height of the disco era, working on 47th Street in New York. And my uh, apartment wasn't too far from uh, a walk down to Studio 54. Bought a Harley Davidson before it was fashionable, and decided that was I could travel on it. Headed for Southern California. Pulled into San Diego, living out of my saddlebags, and uh, the only job I could find right off the get-go, really quick, I was down on the waterfront. I got a job as a bouncer, a topless bar. And it was supposedly just a quick job, pick up some money and move on, but uh, I stayed there for three years. Outlaw motorcycle gangs own the uh, tattoo parlors. I worked for the mafia and hung out with the outlaws. Decided to learn a lot about the street and the world. Married a dancer, had a daughter, and decided this absolutely crazy wild life. It needed to be some settling down. So I took the family and we moved to Colorado. Then I became a single father, needed a job to do something, and I took a job as a uh, deputy sheriff. At 40 years old, I went through the police academy. I ended up 11 years on the special police team for the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. I would stroll down the street and just, this is, this is just what, the same streets that I'd ridden down as an outlaw. And uh, I'd run into old friends. You know, some of the tattoo parlors had the same guys had, that had given me my tattoos. I had the same mustache, <laughs> and people recognized me. From there, uh, I met uh, a wonderful woman. We got married and opened another art gallery and jewelry store back in the jewelry business. And she wanted to computerize it. I said, why would you want a computer? A computer? What a horrible thing. But she so said, yeah, we'll computerize the business. So I, we did. She got a computer. It was kind of cool. I thought, you know, wow, this is really a neat thing, this computer. And then she got this little digital camera. This is a two and a half megapixel Sony digital camera. Well, I fell in love with that. I thought, this is a kick. Photography could be it. I started to do some uh, human interest things. I was uh, working with the Museum of Northwest Colorado. Uh, I approached them and said, you know, I'd like to do the women of Moffat County and go around and photograph and document all the old ranch women. They had stories. It was a great project and I, I'd be kind of captivated by people's emotions, their things, their feelings. So I'd been coming down to Tucson to uh, the gem show for years. I wanted to come here and photograph the border and what was going on. There was something here, nobody was here. We moved, we figured out our finances, we would be here with no house payment and live within our means and we brought uh, our horses down. We picked this place because the back gate opens onto 2,000 acres of state land. That borders the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge which is I believe 117,000 acres. So I could go out on horseback and photograph the migrant trails. I would follow them down to the Mexican border. I run into drug runners, I run into the migrants and photograph the trails and what's out there. As it unfolded, as we became a part of the community, more things started to happen and the soldiers came and the walls and the tower are starting to build. And I have a ringside seat. I'm sitting right here in Aravaca. You know, and news teams were coming down here from all over the world. They go to the coffee shop, interview the same people and go home. Then you get out into the desert. You know, you can cover the issues, but until you're out in the field and actually come across the migrants. I was on a, an unofficial sort of a walk with a group of Border Patrol agents in the field. And we'd come across a group that just <laughs> split in all directions. You know, they would grab them here and grab them there. That's what they do. They're running them down. It's just like this fiasco. They drop what they have. They, I mean, I'm like, this is crazy, you know? These people just running in all directions. Some stopped, some hid, some, and they handcuffed two together and said, watch these two, you know? It's like, okay, and everybody's run off in directions. So I've got these two, two migrants, <laughs> illegal barter crossers, uh, whatever you want to call them there. These two, uh, a young kid and an older guy sitting there, and it was so moving 
they're they're handcuffed together. These they're just normal people, workers. They're so terrified, so bummed out. So I mean, just you know, everything that's going through their head is just you're, you're just feeling this energy. So now I've got all this equipment and knowledge, and I'm hooked on the journalistic uh, humanity piece. I've covered the border. Now the country needs to be covered. Find the mar the mar uh, migrants into the factories, the fields, and and do basically it'll be America.